Good. Oh, wow, we had some early starters. Hello, welcome in the webinar. Welcome. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Please grab some tea or coffee if you want. And we'll start in three minutes. Um Welcome, guys. Uh, some early, very on-time joiners. Uh, thank you for being on time. We will start in uh, two minutes on the dot of 11. All right, guys, we'll get started in one minute. Uh... Grab a drink if you have not yet. Okay, let's get started slowly. Um, thank you all for being here today. Lisa, could you move to the first slide? Thank you. Yeah, so thank you and welcome to this webinar on an introduction to the fundamentals of climate private equity. Today is really a introduction to the concept of uh, private equity. What is private equity as an asset class and how can private equity help solve uh, the most important climate challenges? And finally, how can you potentially also invest in climate private equity through carbon equity? We will not go into very advanced topics uh, as such as uh, the J curve or like specific technicalities on private equity. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask these throughout. We actually really encourage uh, yeah, interactive participation. We'd love to get all of your questions. If there are certain questions that we do not or are not able to cover throughout the webinar, we will try to get back to you uh, through email or set up a separate call to go into in-depth questions. If you have questions and when you have questions, kindly put that in the Q&A section um, of Zoom, uh, probably in the header or otherwise in the bottom bar of your Zoom interface, you will see Q&A. Um, and you can ask any questions here. I believe you can also upvote each other's questions, uh, not 100% sure. Um, 
yeah, but feel free to ask any questions. We'd love to hear them. Uh, you can also uh, message in the chat. Actually, quite interesting. If you would like to introduce yourself, don't. No, no, it's not needed, but uh, if you would like, uh, feel free to introduce your name and your role in uh, the chat uh, as we get started. All right. Um, well, before we get started, I'd love to get briefly get to know you. Um, and uh, so I'm going to ask you one uh, question through the poll, just to understand what your experience is uh, with uh, investing in uh, private equity. So here is the question. What is your experience investing in private equity? Um, do you have a zero experience just yet? Have you done angel or some crowd equity investments? Have you already invested in a fund, a venture capital or a private equity fund? Uh, have you invested in a fund of funds, either with carbon equity or not? Or have you done all of the above? All right. Okay, I'll give you a few more minutes. We're almost there. Okay, uh, five more seconds. Okay. All right, um, I'm going to end the poll uh, right now and share the results. What have we? All right, so 50% has no experience investing in private equity yet, and 50% has some experience, of which 18% um, have invested in a fund of funds, 11% uh, in angel or crowd equity investments, 7% uh, have invested in a single fund and 13% are uh, have done all of the above. And so I might be considered expert investors. Again, we try to tailor the level of this um, webinar to everybody, but do feel free to ask any questions you might have. All right. Um, yeah, so for today... Um, we're going to talk about four topics. We're going to talk about what is private equity, just to understand the fundamentals of private equity as an asset class. Secondly, we will talk about how does that now apply to solving uh, our climate challenge and what is climate private equity? What are examples of climate venture capital and private equity investments? What is what we think the great opportunity of uh, climate investing? Um, and finally, what does carbon equity do and how can you invest in climate venture capital and private equity through us? All right. Um, and before we get into the mode, let me kindly briefly introduce our speakers for today. Uh, myself, Jacqueline van den Ende, uh, CEO and one of the co-founders of Carbon Equity. I have started my career in private equity with Hall Investments. More recently was a partner with a Dutch venture capital fund called Peak Capital and spent the other half of my career building uh, companies amongst others, a rocket internet uh, powered online real estate platform of Southeast Asia called uh, Lamudi. With me today is uh, Wiebe Fischer. Uh, Viva, I think if you say something, uh, people will see you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, cool. So Viva is a managing director and he leads our investment team. Uh, and Viva has spent over 11 years with Alpenvest, um, which is, uh, I always call this the Champions League of fund investing. So he's an absolute expert in uh, fund, uh, private equity uh, fund investing. And prior to that, he spent five years in with JP Morgan in uh, London. Lisa Rubinstein is one of the co-founders of Carbon Equity and Chief Impact. She leads our impact diligence, impact thesis, and impact uh, thought leadership. Uh, and Lisa built her career with McKinsey, really specializing on energy transition and sustainability. You will meet them both. Uh, and let me now introduce you to uh, Wiebe Fischer to kick off with a brief introduction on what is private equity. Thank you, Wiebe. Yes, thank you very much, Jacqueline. Um, so let's let's start with private equity and, and the role private equity can play in any portfolio. Um, so if, if, if you look at how you could build your portfolio, I think uh, many people will have cash. Um, uh, they will have some fixed income products. Uh, for example, a savings account. Um, in the past years, that has not been very attractive, very low yields uh, on, uh, on those type of products. So people have been looking for higher returning asset classes, such as equity or real estate. 
Now, within equity, meaning buying shares in companies, um, you have public stocks. So anyone with a mobile nowadays can invest in, in public stocks. Um, and it's interesting, but if you want to have, besides return, also more impact, I think private equity is uh, a place that's opening up for um, private in, in, uh, investors, and we're helping out. Now, what does private equity mean? Private equity means literally investing in companies that are not listed on stock exchange. However, there are different strategies. For example, you have venture capital, that's really investing in the early stage companies. You have growth equity, that's also part of private equity, but focuses really on scaling up companies that have a proven technology or proven products. And then finally, you have buyout. So those are really the more mature companies, profitable, and they can either be sold to other investors or listed on the stock exchange. All those three segments are private equity. And also in climate tech, everyone's on it, is active across all these three sectors. So the role private equity plays in each of those sectors is different. So in venture capital, it's really helping founders develop a new product, a new idea, and trying to gain traction with customers. And you have the so-called pre-seed, seed, and series A rounds. Once a company has a real uh, product market fit and has multiple customers, but just wants to scale or build new plans, then growth equity comes in, in the so-called series B or series C rounds and sometimes D, E, F, all the way what's needed up until IPO and exit. Now, what is the, the, the return profile of private equity? If you compare it to other opportunities that private investors have on the equity side, the risk in return is medium to high, but attractive if you compare it, for example, to private equity. Private equity has a very high risk profile you need to select the right companies very early stage, and it's difficult to get access to the right opportunities there. If you pick right though, you can have good impact there as well. Other opportunities that you could have is for example, investing in um, uh, solar plants, also th through crowdfunding, more infrastructure type of investments. Those are lower risk, lower return, could be impactful. Again, if you pick the right ones. If you look at the risk return profile of public investing there, if you invest in ETF trackers, um, uh, then it can be very low risk. Returns depends really very much on how good you are in picking the right stocks, but your capital doesn't flow into the company. So you, you, you buy shares from a, a selling shareholder. In private equity, the, the key attraction apart from the, the return outlook, and I will go into it, the return profile is interesting, is that you can have real impact. And Lisa will explain more and uh, and how that's how that's done. Comparing private equity to public equity is important, I think, in this session. So, an investment in a company that's not listed typically involves a large stake. So, an, an investment firm that buys a stake in a company wants to have control, and that control is necessary to achieve its targets and to really drive the growth of a business. Now, that control you will not have if you invest in a public company. You are a passive investor. It's very difficult to change the, the direction of a management team in public stocks. Now, second good thing in private equity is you have very strong alignment with the management team. They are shareholders as well, and they really have the same goal as, as, the, as the shareholders. If you look more at the, um, uh, the risk side of private equity, it's more difficult to access private equity. You cannot just buy shares somewhere and, uh, and it's difficult to sell the positions. So you're in there for a longer term, it's called illiquid. Uh, public equity, the attraction is the moment you want to sell, you press the button and you sell. Key, key distinction. Also publicly available stocks have reports available on their websites. Companies have a reporting obligation and they are very transparent. That's not the case for private equity. It's therefore difficult to choose the right investments. You don't have that information. The cost levels can be different to access private equity. There are a medium to high costs involved depending on which strategy you choose. Whereas for publicly traded stocks, there are products available that are super cheap. So these are kind of the drivers of the risk return profile of each of the two opportunities. 
And it's good, good to understand that. Now, what are the key, key reasons to add private equity to your portfolio? There are three, really. One, the opportunity set for private equity is much larger than for public equity. So the number of companies that are not listed on stock exchanges is way, way, way larger than the number of companies that are listed. So in the US alone, there are 6 million companies with employees that are not listed and only 4,300 that are listed. So um, uh, that opportunity set makes it very attractive. Now, secondly, the returns for private equity historically have been very strong. On the left-hand side, you see the, uh, the performance, the annual returns of uh, listed or, or of liquid strategies. So strategies that invest in public markets. There, through the cycle, and this is a 10 year, um, uh, has, been, has been measured on a 10 year basis. So with the global financial crisis in there from 2008 to 2018, the annual return for public equity investing has been 9%. While over the same period of time, if you have invested in private equity, the median annual return has been 13.9%. So both are the median, median outcomes. And there you see there's almost a 5% premium when you invest in private equity. And therefore you see that all the large institutional investors have private equity now as a fundamental part of their strategy. There's a, it's, it's, a, it's really an outperformance. Now, that 5% premium is called so-called illiquidity premium. You want to be rewarded for the fact that you cannot easily sell that, um, um, uh, that position. But what does that 5% annual return mean over a long period of time. If you have a 5% additional return over a very long period of time, there's exponential return on top of it. Here you see it, if you compare the private equity returns over time, over a long period of time, after let's say 20, 30 years, it really, really accumulates. The, the value gap with public investing is very high. It does require that you continue to invest in, in private equity and you re, uh, reinvest all the, re, uh, the proceeds that you get. There's one thing that's though very critical in private equity investing. You need to select the right opportunities and you need to be able to do that. Because if you don't, then the downside risk is also higher. So on the right hand side, you see the uh, dispersion between the top performance and the lowest performance, and there's a, there's, a, there's a big gap. Whereas in public equity, if you invest in certain fund managers, the discrepancy between the top performance and the lowest performance is much smaller. So being able to select the right opportunities is really, really important in private equity. Now, how can you access private equity? What are the different ways that you can invest? First, you can invest yourself directly into a company, so-called angel investing. That is typically done by people who have either a lot of capital and a lot of time and a lot of access to good deal flow. You need to be able to spend time analyzing an opportunity, a technology, meet the founder team, but also have sufficient deal flow to choose from. It's high risk, high return, and typically more for the professional investors. A second option is to invest in a private equity fund. Could be a venture capital fund, could be a growth equity fund. But by doing that, you have a diversified portfolio um, straight away because a private equity fund typically has somewhere between 10 to 20 underlying portfolio companies in it. And that's very nice, uh, more diversified, therefore lower risk than if you invest directly, but you need to be able to pick the right fund and have access to those funds. If you don't have that and don't have the time to select the right funds, then you have a third option and invest through so-called fund of funds. So then you invest in a basket of funds, um, typically ranging between five to 15, and each of those funds that you invest in, uh, that is in the fund of fund, has again 10 to 20 investments. So overall your portfolio would range um, between 50 to over 200 companies in there. And this is really a good way if you have no experience and start investing in private equity, then I think a fund of fund makes a lot of sense to start there.
Then let's look at the, the risk of losing your capital. It's a higher risk um, segment, private equity. So let's spend a bit of time on that. If you select a single fund, then based on historical results, the chance of a fund uh, losing some of your capital in the end is 24%. Now, if you pull five of those funds together in a fund of funds, then risk of losing some capital drops from 24 to 4%. So their diversification really helps and reduces that risk. And if you have a portfolio of nine funds in there, it's almost negligible. So diversification really helps preventing uh, yeah, losing capital. But it's more on the downside, the downside risk. So how does a fund actually work? A private equity manager raises a fund on a certain day, and it takes probably well, a good manager raises it overnight. Um, on average, I would say it's up to a year they take to raise capital from all sorts of investors. Once they have closed the fund, they have that capital available to invest in new opportunities. So the moment you commit to a fund, you don't know yet what will ultimately be in the portfolio. It's so-called a blind pool capital. The fund manager then has five years to invest in new portfolio companies. And then thereafter, for the remainder of the fund life, it can still invest into those portfolio companies for follow-on investments, for new rounds. For example, they got into a series B, they can follow into a series C round and even a series D round. But from year, let's say year three up until year 10, they can also start selling some of these investments. It's the so-called harvesting phase. So you will see that the first couple of years, there's more cash outflows to build a portfolio. And then from year three, when they start selling, you will get more cash inflows. Break even typically is in year seven, and from year seven all the way up uh, until the end of the fund life, that's when you will receive all your return for your capital gain. But you should be mindful, it's a long term investment. So, what do these managers actually do with your capital? What are they being paid for? <clears throat> so, they really scan the market for all the right opportunities out there. That's, that's really their bread and butter. They have a net expert network. They work with scientists, especially in climate tech, to find the, the new, uh, most promising technologies. Um, they are uh, going to all sorts of conferences, scanning the market, building the best pipeline to select opportunities from. That's what they do. Then they diligence. They spend time with advisors. Could be financial advisors, could be scientific advisors, could be uh, audit firms, anyone who can help them um, diligence the opportunity they will bring along and then ultimately select the, uh, the best opportunities and negotiate the best terms. And then finally, once they have acquired it, that's where the magic happens. That's where they create value. And it's really focused on two things. It's really supporting companies in their growth trajectory, moving into new geographies, launching new, new products, new services, um, build new plans. Um, uh, that's where they support the management teams and they have a, a, a lot of expertise in doing that. And then they also professionalize the businesses, put in place the best management teams, have good reporting um, uh, uh, practices uh, in place. And once the company has then grown, is more mature, hopefully profitable in the end, they can sell or list the business. So this is really what, what, um, uh, what they're paid for and what they do for you. Cool. So um, understanding what the private equity assets class is. Um, now we'll talk about how does this apply to climate investing. Um, and before we talk about what climate private equity is, I'd love to ask you one more question. Um, which is uh, why you have taken an interest or are potentially interested in climate investing. Um, so what is the number one reason? I know that there are many reasons why people might be interested, but what is the number one reason why you think you might be interested in climate investing? Is it because you feel that you can make superior returns, climate being a massive growth market, 
Is it because you wish to diversify uh, your portfolio of investments? Or three, do you wish for your money to have a positive climate impact? Um, or is it another reason? And if another reason, I would love to learn more about that in the chat. Uh, so initially the chat was disabled, now it's working. And um, so please feel free to uh, put your comments on your other reasons in the chat. All right, I'll give you 30 more seconds to participate. All right, cool. Okay, three, two, one, ending the poll right now. Um, and we have a, a pretty climate motivated group. 79% uh, of people uh, feel uh, or their primary motivation is to have positive climate impacts uh, with their money. 10% uh, feel they make a, can make a superior returns. I hope uh, more of you will feel they can make superior returns um, after this uh, webinar. Um, and 5% seeks to diversify their portfolio and 6% uh, uh, mentioned other, of which we're getting some uh, chats, recommend chats inputs. Uh, it is a combination of all three. Yes, that is true. I on purpose did not put that in the options. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing. Um, Lisa, may I ask you uh, to take it away on climate private equity? Absolutely. Such an impact motivated group. Very keen to tell you more. So let's start with what is climate private equity? Well, basically, it's about investing in climate tech. Now, what's climate tech? Climate tech is basically any kind of innovation that is explicitly focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And interestingly, that can be either hardware or software or something about in between. And let's start on the right in software. It's kind of the traditional venture capital game. Uh, there's actually a lot of software that we need to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And an example there is normative. It's also in our portfolio. It's a carbon accounting tool that's kind of based on a financial statement. So with very light actual manual labor, can give you a very accurate estimation of your carbon footprint, which then helps companies prioritize where they should begin decarbonizing their business. But there's tons of other software that we need. So we also need a lot of software to stabilize our grids, to make sure that demand and supply of electricity match each other to make sure that our buildings are smart and don't produce more heat than we need to make sure that we have all the right marketplaces where we can buy and sell solar panels and anything else we need to get to net zero so there's a lot of software involved and then there's also a lot of hardware involved because in the end it's stuff in our economy that's producing greenhouse gas emissions and we need to kind of transform that stuff into something else that gives us the same value without the carbon emissions to give you one example, again, from our portfolio, Sunfire is a company that is really optimizing the hydrogen production machine. So uh, typically there's an alkaline uh, production machine for uh, producing hydrogen, uh, but they have um, a solid electrolyzer, which uh, is much more efficient, meaning that you need less electricity to produce the same amount of hydrogen, meaning you can do it cheaper, which is critical because hydrogen can help replace any kind of high temperature process uh, that's now done with coal or gas or oil. And then maybe go into the hybrid because there's actually a lot of exciting hybrid business models popping up that make a lot of sense. Lego Labs is an example of that. Uh, it's a company that on the hardware side has developed this unique wood-based composites that you can use to build buildings. You can actually build buildings up to 80 meters uh, with this material and exclusively this material. So you don't need any concrete, you don't need any steel, you just need Lego Labs wood. Um, but the question is, how do you make that super scalable? Which is in the end, both what we need to get to net zero because we need to scale these solutions rapidly, but also what the venture capital and private equity game is all about. You invest in companies, you help them grow and you sell them because they became bigger. So Lego Labs has made itself very scalable. First of all, because they have an AI that can translate any kind of building design into a Lego Labs design. So you just plug it in and a Lego design rolls out. And then that design is sent to a robotized production line where basically in a highly automated way, these panels are produced, are shipped to wherever you want to build it. And then you can kind of build the entire building in three weeks because all the parts are already completed. So hardware, software in between. Let's talk about sectors for a minute because climate tech spans six sectors. Uh, we need all of these six, six sectors to get to net zero. And actually, these six sectors are most of the global economy. So let's walk through them for a little bit. 
First of all, it's about how we plug in, basically the energy we use. So it's about all the electricity we produce. Electricity is about 25% of global emissions, but it's also about the fuel we produce. So not the fuel we burn in our car, but what it costs to dig up the oil, ship it halfway across the globe uh, and refine it. That actually also produces a lot of emissions. Then it's about how we get around our mobility. It's about aviation, it's about shipping, it's about trucks, it's about cars. Together, about 15% of global emissions. A very important component is how we make things, our industry. There's a lot of materials we produce to build, to wear, to you know, sit on. Um, but a very big part of it is, for example, is concrete. It's about 8% of global emissions. Steel and other metals is another 5%. We're talking about plastics. We're talking about waste management. It's a very diverse sector about how we live, the buildings. And it's only 6% in this overview because only 6% of emissions are produced in buildings. So this is not about the materials, but it's about how we live in them. So when we turn on the heat, when we cook, when we turn on the air conditioning, all those kinds of applications. Then agriculture is another 22%. It's everything that we grow and produce and transform. Uh, and a big part of that is proteins, animal proteins. I think most of you know that by now. Personally, there's a lot of exciting innovation happening there. And last of all, there's carbon. So even if we get these five sectors to zero, um, we need carbon removal and carbon capture and storage to make sure that we also bring down the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Basically, any kind of carbon scenario we have, we will overshoot our carbon budget and have to compensate for that after that. And maybe one third look on the whole climate tech spectrum. Uh, we see investments in climate tech across the entire kind of maturity chain that Viva just explained. So we start with kind of pre-seed investments, low pre-seed investments. Again, all of these examples are from the carbon equity portfolio. Citration is a battery recycling company, making sure that all the metals that we've used once, we use again, so we don't have to dig up new stuff. Planetary is about fermentation. So how can we produce plant-based proteins that are really, really tasty and very similar? Uh, there's actually a lot of demand for the facilities in which these are produced. There's a company building those and renting those out. But we can keep going through the examples, but the most important message here is that it starts very small pre-seed investments of one, two, maybe three million. And it runs up all the way to Series E and beyond. Uh, we just had a round in our portfolio of 450 million US dollars to make sure that we're scaling out the plants that we need so many of. And maybe one last note on um, buyouts, because it's an interesting play that we also see popping up increasingly. We're also very excited to start committing to. Uh, this is about buying a majority share in a company, so really becoming the majority owner, uh, and then uh, becoming super active in that company, again, all with the goal of scaling. So Gidara, for example, is a company that has really figured out how to use municipal waste and turn that into biogas. Um, and for that, they kind of know how to build one plant. And now our partners, a buyout firm, got involved to make sure that we don't have one plant, but we have a thousand plants as soon as possible. I'm going to dive into two examples a little bit more, just because it really, I think, makes it all come to life. So the first is Form Energy that we just talked about, the 450 million round. In total, by now, they raised 800 million. The challenge that they're trying to solve is that electricity generation causes a lot of emissions. We just talked about 23% global emissions. I think I just said 25, apologies for that, it's 23. Um, the good news is that we know how to produce renewable electricity super cheap. Solar, wind, energy are both way cheaper than any kind of fossil fuel by now. Uh, these are exponential cost curves and uh, well, we've been hearing it all around. The problem though is that renewable energy is intermittent, meaning that the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, but we do want electricity 24 seven. So how do we solve that? Well, we need to store that electricity when we're producing it in excess so that we can use it when there's demand but not a lot of supply. And the best way to do that is with batteries. There's a few other applications, but batteries has been considered a critical solution. The problem is that sometimes they're quite expensive. Well, this is where firm energy comes in. They developed a battery that can run at 10% of the cost of the lithium ion battery, meaning that if you combine a firm energy storage facility with a wind or solar production farm together, that's cheaper than uh, gas-based electricity. So it's really a systems cost effectiveness change that they facilitate. And what they do, to put it very bluntly, they rust and de-rust iron. 
So uh, they've been thinking about it, scientists, for decades, but Forum kind of figured out how to do this at scale. So uh, um, when, let me see, iron rusts, uh, that's when actually electricity is released. And when you put electricity through their materials, then it de-rusts and that then captures that electricity. It's a massive market is operating in. The global battery market right now is 112 billion. It's expected to almost quadruple. Um, and Firm Energy is looking to be a big winner in that. Completely different example, different sector, different industry, uh, not B2B, B2C, current foods. Uh, Asner just invested in it from the fund that we're committed to. I think it's super exciting. I actually got to taste this plant-based raw tuna uh, a few weeks ago, and it was so good that some people didn't realize it was fake. I didn't think it was possible, but it's already here. So what's the problem with fishing? Well, there's a few problems in terms of climate. The first is that a lot of fishing is done through a technology that's called bottom crawl trolling, which means that basically we dig up the seabed at the bottom of the ocean to fish everything that's close to it. Uh, but the seabed is basically one big carbon sink. So if you disturb it, a lot of carbon is released. So actually estimates are that it releases as much carbon, the current bottom trolling we do, as all of aviation combined, which is insane. Then there's a second thing, which is that fish are actually little carbon sinks that are floating around and at some point sink to the bottom of the ocean when they die. And actually it's estimated that about half the total impact from uh, the seafood industry from burning uh, fuels to move the ships around is then also created because of these fish, fish populations. Because what happens is naturally they flow in the sea and they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean, they stay there for a hundred years. Uh, but if we fish them up, then we eat them and actually burn them in our own bodies and they become carbon emissions. So plant-based is the better way to go. And I see there's one little note. It's also really good for biodiversity. Let me just point that out. I think carbon equity is really focused on what are the technologies that will get us net zero as soon as possible. But there's tons of good side effects to the companies that we're investing in. And some of these companies are also really focusing on optimizing those side effects, like taking care of biodiversity. Anyway, this solution, raw plant-based tuna, that's just as good, just as tasty, and just as nutritious. Its main ingredients are algae, radish, potato, bamboo, all local ingredients that you can grow close to where they're produced. Uh, and again, a massive market. So the alternative protein market today is at 60 billion, and it's expected to grow to 100 or to 200 billion in the coming years. Um, and if you take like a different lens at it, the, just the canned tuna market is going to be 12 billion. So if they get to play a significant role there, which they look like they will. Again, huge opportunity. So I'm going to take you through maybe one more point that a lot of people kind of have been like wondering about, right? So there's ESG investing that everybody's talking about, but then there's also impact investing. And I think it's critical to understand that ESG investing is not the same as impact investing. So ESG investing is all about using information on environmental, social, and governance factors to price and risk better and make financial, superior financial returns. Now, all of this is about internal, meaning it's all about kind of like how the business is run and that in the operations that it does, it doesn't create any negative side effects. Whereas impact investing, totally different game. First of all, the goal is different. The goal is to generate positive social and environmental impact alongside financial return. So you want to have both an impact and a return, which is what 80% of our participants said is what they wanted to achieve. Importantly, it's all about kind of the external impact. So it's not about whether the business is running in a responsible way, but it's about whether its products and services, what it makes and sells and brings into the world has a positive impact on the world. And so that means it's all about funding solutions. And let's dive in a little bit deeper to make this very concrete. What is ESG investing? I took the two most popular ESG ETFs in the global public markets. What's in it? Well, it's mostly software um, and some other businesses, Amazon, Tesla, Home Depot, uh, companies that are run responsibly, at least according to the way that it's measured in ESG. Um, but I wouldn't say that their products are the most critical products that we need to get to net zero. So if you do want your money to help get to net zero, what is it you can do? Well, there it's critical that you understand the difference between investor impacts and company impact, because these are two different things. 
So company impact is about what does a company do and bring into the world? And I think Tesla is a great example there, right? They make electric cars. These electric cars are sold because of that fewer gas-fueled cars are sold. So Tesla has a positive impact on the world. Some critical blind notes to be made, but let's skip that. But then it's about investor impact, right? How does your money have an impact? Well, if you buy a share of Tesla, it doesn't really change the world because Tesla, you're buying that share from someone else, not from Tesla directly. So your money doesn't go into the company. Best case scenario, the stock price goes up and certain things become a little bit easier for them, but it's all quite indirect. Investor impact is what we really want to focus on. So how do you do that? There's actually two ways to be impactful as an investor. The first is that you can enable impactful companies to grow. It's about both. It's about selecting impactful companies and then helping them grow. Again, with the Tesla example, it is an impactful company, but your money doesn't really help them grow. Helping companies grow is most critical in the early stages when external funding is going directly into these companies to make, give them the ability to invest more. And then the second thing you can do as an investor is you can encourage improvement in any kind of company you own. And that's called active ownership. And it can be about helping brown companies become green or green companies become better. Uh, lots of improvements to be had as well. And maybe just wrap it all up. So there's private equity, there's public equity. There's two ways to have the impact. You can enable growth. You can encourage improvements. Carbon equity thesis is both investor impact tools are more powerful in private equity than in public equity. Because in private equity, your capital is used directly to fund the growth of, of impactful businesses. Uh, and a fund manager who is acting on your behalf with your money will actively support these companies to grow and improve in the ways that Liebe just described. On the public equity markets, both of these instruments are just less directly, less strongly impactful. Uh, because enabling growth, you can buy shares, but you buy them from someone else. So the money doesn't directly go into the company. It doesn't really help them grow. Uh, and in public equity, it's also hard to encourage improvement. So active ownership, using voting and dialogue and maybe file resolutions, it's possible in the public market. It's being done. There's a few very exciting organizations really kind of optimizing that tool. I think Follow This is a great example. They're trying to transform the oil industry through active ownership. Um, but typically, most ESG ETF stocks you will commit to won't be doing much in this regard. So that's our view on climate tech, climate tech PE investing, how to have a real impact with your money. And I'll hand it over to Viva to kind of talk about the opportunity of all of this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, these examples are always very, uh, very exciting. I mean, there, we see so many, so many interesting new technologies and ideas out there. And uh, we want to move as much capital towards these solutions. There's a, there's a huge opportunity here, clearly, and an exciting one. Um, and we're not the only ones. So if you if you look at the, the climate tech market, it is really growing fast. So there's a 45% yearly growth. Um, 10 years ago, there was hardly any climate tech. There was some clean tech. But right now, if you look at the amount of capital that's flowing into venture capital focused on climate tech investing, it was 40 billion, close to 40 billion. In 2021 and this year it's estimated to be close to 60 billion so that's a good thing in that direction and and uh, we're excited to be uh, to be part of that it, luckily it also returns so we want to have impact clearly but it also helps if if you can make a good return um it's early innings but if you look at the, the returns of the investments that have been made between 2015 and 2019, climate tech is outperforming um, the global venture capital and private equity markets. So it's, it's still early days, but the returns are there. And, and even today, if you look at the performance of um, the climate tech investments, those that are actually listed on the stock exchange, uh, they seem more stable and less, um, uh, less uh, susceptible for the, for the market, um, uh, market movements. And we also see that in our portfolio, there are up rounds and there continue to be um, uh, ability to raise more capital, whereas other, other market participants are struggling. So good momentum, few data points. Biba, may I ask a question coming from the audience? Uh, Wout van der Bert asking, is the fact that climate tech is growing fast not also a risk? There will only be a few winners in each sector and it will be harder to choose them. I think that's a very valid question. Uh, what is your point of view? 
uh, it's still such such a small market versus where it's going to be. And I, I will address it in a couple of slides. The, the, the growth potential is humongous. A lot of more capital is needed. Um, yes, there will be ultimately a few clear winners, but we need a lot of different technologies. And you will see that there are, there are ultimately in hydrogen, there will be multiple players. It will not be that there is a winner takes all in, in these markets, right? So I think there's plenty of room, but especially plenty of room to grow in each of the, each of the markets. Thank you. So the, the excitement is also seen from the number of unicorns and we're not the only one who get excited by the, uh, the number of businesses that are doing extremely well within climate tech. Uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock has stated that the next thousand unicorns will all be in climate tech. So that's an acknowledgement from, from the, the industry that this is an, an exciting space. And you see it here, the couple of logos, you might recognize a few. Um, it's, uh, it, it's growing fast and we want to make sure that we, uh, we back the, the, next, the next couple of unicorns out there. Like I said, we're just at the beginning. I think, yes, the market is sizable but not nearly as sizable or where it needs to be to get to net zero. So if we, for example, would zoom into meat alternatives, this is already a, a, a relatively sizable market, 9 billion today, but by 2030, 2035, it's estimated to be 290 billion. So that's a 30 fold increase versus where it is today. Um, a lot of, lot of room to grow. Same for green hydrogen. Not much has really uh, been invested today. Uh, a lot of people are talking about it. A lot of plans are being made. Not much capital has actually gone in, but that will grow massively over time, and especially with new, um, uh, the new act, the new Inflation Reduction Act in the US that will be a major push for the hydrogen markets. Um, same goes, uh, uh, oh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I can continue. The, the list of all right, these are there's just two examples, but we, yeah, there's just a lot of excitement, but still a lot of potential to grow. So that, it, that addresses Walter's question. I think I hope it does. Viva, one other question, uh, I think equally relevant question from Jan van Dam. How do we ensure that the impact purpose driven characters of these startups does not develop into too much of a profit driven character once they become very successful and hence profitable? So ultimately, we are not in control there, right? So we um, are an indirect investor and we select fund managers that we think are able to select the most impactful technologies that will have a um, uh, opportunity to actually grow and be successful. So it's not that we will drive for profits or impact. The only thing that we really can do is select the funds that we are certain about have the right impact mentality and focus. And we will discuss it a little bit later on, but that's crucial. That's where we, we come in, we select the management that have impact, and then profit will follow. That's the way, that's our view. Um, uh, they can go in hand in hand, but it's really impact first from uh, our approach point of view. Cool, thank you. All right. Um, thanks for all these questions. Please keep on asking them in the Q&A, uh, ideally, or in the chat if you prefer. Um, finally, a few words on, on what carbon equity exactly does. Um, so the first thing that we do, so carbon equity is a platform that enables access to some of the world's top climate venture capital and private equity investors, if, uh, climate equity climate private equity funds <laughs> sorry um so the first thing that we do is we select funds this is step number one curation in which the aim is to select let's say the top five percent most climate impactful and financially interesting funds we look at a landscape of approximately 800 funds globally many of these are in the us and in europe and we look at uh, the whole range of early stage funds to growth equity funds to buyout funds. We also see a range of funds that are fully and specifically dedicated towards climate tech. And on the other hand, funds that are slightly have a slightly broader impact mandate. But for us, it's always about funds that are really focused on solving climate challenges uh, through their investments. How do we select those funds? 
Well, there are four steps in this process, of which the, the first and, and most important step in, in our process is the climate diligence step. And the climate diligence step helps us uh, differentiate what are funds that are truly and intrinsically and consistently motivated and aligned to achieve climate impact versus what are funds that are more superficially committed to, uh, to climate impact and uh, what we might also call greenwashing. Now on the next slide, we can get an understanding of how we do that. So we've developed a climate, a proprietary climate impact diligence framework, which helps us assess how the quality of impact, how is impact embedded in every single step of the process? And so we ask questions such as, uh, how do you select for impact? What are the impact goals or thresholds that a single portfolio company should meet for you to invest in that company? What are the impact goals that you have at a portfolio level? How are your incentives aligned to make sure that you're actually focusing and realizing the impact that you have promised? Um, how do you decide on impact at the level of the investment committee? But not only what is on paper, but also what are your actual uh, real life decisions? So we will look at a portfolio and have a look at what investment decisions have they made to date and how do they match up to that impact mandate that they had on paper. Once we feel confident and we are uncompromising in terms of our climate impact diligence. So a fund needs to achieve a score of three out of five for them to continue in the process of our diligence. So we never take shortcuts here. The second step in the process is that we say, okay, well, is this also a financially sensible investment, right? Uh, people are investing very serious amounts for carbon equity. And so it also needs to be a financially sensible uh, and attractive investment. This is where really the expertise of, uh, well, Viba, Abbas, the people coming from Alp Invest comes in. How do we evaluate a fund from a returns perspective? And so we'll have a look at who are the managers of the fund, who's on the team, what's their expertise and experience, what do historical financial track records look like, how are they made up? What does the governance structure look like? Um, what, again, what investments have they made to date? What do we think of those? What do we think of the valuation? And do we see a, a risk of uh, too high valuations in the portfolio? Um, and so based on a comprehensive assessment of both climate impact, as well as the financial uh, perspective, we make an investment proposal, which is submitted to an external investment committee, um, which then decides to make a commitment to such a fund. That brings us to the second thing that we do. And so the first thing that we do is curation of climate funds. And the second thing that we do is we enable access. Typically, you need five, if not 10 million euros to invest in top uh, venture capital and private equity funds, the funds that we're investing in. Um, and typically, even for high net worth individuals, for, for big family offices, that's a really sizable commitment to invest in a single fund. What carbon equity does is we aggregate um, lower amounts uh, as a result of which we can offer smaller ticket access. So most of the core funds at carbon equity start from 100,000 euros, where the average invested amount is approximately 220,000 euros. We recently, through the Climate Investment Club, up, created an opportunity for you to also invest below 100,000 euros, but ensuring that we uh, enable access through the network that we have, the expertise in selecting these funds, and making sure that we aggregate many investors to offer access to a yeah, absolute a unique opportunity. Yes, yeah, so small ticket access, top curated funds, and uh, effortless investing. You can invest through carbon equity in two ways. You can invest in a single fund or in a fund of funds. Uh, in a single fund, you invest typically in a yeah, single fund, typically invest in, in between 10 to 30 different companies. A fund of funds allows you more diversification. So, for example, in the current decarbonization climate tech fund of funds, you're invested in more or less 200 companies. 150 to 200 companies through seven to eight underlying climate venture capital and growth equity funds. So the reason to choose a fund of funds is really diversification. The reason to choose a single fund is that you might have a clear preference for a specific theme, let's say agro food, 
build environment, a growth equity fund. In that case, there are occasional possibilities to invest in single funds. So ultimately what carbon equity allows you to do is to enable to get diversified exposure to anywhere between 20 to let's say 200 uh, climate technology companies for a single investment. And one of the key parts of our value proposition is this is not just about parking your money with impact, but we actually want to take you on a journey. So in Q1 next year, we'll be launching the app where you can actually track all of the companies that you're invested in and see what they're doing. Uh, and uh, through webinars uh, and also uh, soon coming soon, uh, climate tech drinks, uh, we seek to educate, but also bring the community together. Cool. Well, I hope you enjoyed that short outline of what is private equity, what is climate private equity, and how can you invest through carbon equity? Um, I'll go for a couple of your questions now. Of course, there are many topics that might have not have been covered so again, please do feel free to reach out to us. You can reach out to us through the Carbon Equity website, which is carbonequity.com, through our LinkedIn. You can email us at uh, invest at carbonequity.com or get in touch with any of the people on our team. Let me go through a couple of the questions that we have gotten. Uh, Paolo Barbazino asks, uh, would you describe Carbon Equity as a thematic fund of funds? or in the way that you manage your portfolio, you play a more proactive stance when it comes to the green transition. Lisa, may I ask you uh, that question? Yeah, how do we think about that impact? If I understand Paula's question correctly, it's mostly about how active are we, right? So are we just offering access or are we doing more? And there I would say we're really doing more. So one part is the impact due diligence that Jacqueline described. It's a very active process. We're working with these fund managers to get all the data together. And then most of these fund managers tell us we never had such an extensive feedback on our entire approach. Uh, it's inspiring us to do better. And then I start working with these funds to actually make sure that they further improve their already pretty good climate impact approaches. So on the fund side, being very active, really pushing for change, building a community, and then also on the portfolio side. So we're starting to also create interaction between the portfolio companies that our funds have invested in and our LPs. So we organize meet and manage their sessions where you can really learn about these companies. Maybe in dual course, we'll start organizing really tools and ways for you to start interacting. Our goal is really to build a community, get people involved and make sure that these companies grow as quickly as possible. Cool, thank you. Do, do you also engage with the funds to drive uh, the impact mentality forward? So how do we work with, yeah, taking the funds along also on their impact journey? Yeah, that's critical. So most of the funds we're working with, they have a head of impact. It's very strongly positioned in the fund. So that will be my direct counterpart. I work with them in a due diligence process, but then I keep talking to them about how they can improve further. I start organizing sessions where I bring all of these heads of impact together around topics that everybody's trying to figure out, right? How to do kind of like impact potential quantification, right? How should I think about our investor impact as a fund? How can we quantify that? There's so much interest to further engage. And I think Carbon Equity is really well positioned to bring these people together. We're starting to do it and make sure that we're driving the best practices in the sector. Cool, thank you. Uh, Viva, Aaron asks, do you see any difference in private equity funds taking a different approach to support portfolio companies between the traditional industries and climates? Um, uh, are they taking similar aggressive value creation approaches that we are typically used from, or does that differ? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, private equity is well known for certain aggressive uh, measures uh, that largely happens in large buyouts, so putting a lot of debt on a company or cutting a lot of costs, firing employees and creating value that way. I mean, that's that's what you read in news uh, now and then. That's definitely not the approach that Climate Tech right now has, right? So Climate Tech really invests in uh, new companies, new technologies, growing them, scaling them. Um, and that's a completely different phase. There, there's no leverage involved. These companies are difficult to leverage. Um, so that doesn't play a role. It's not about firing people, but about hiring people. So more people uh, are needed and all of those companies are, are really looking for, for new talent. So it's a completely different, different phase. Same name, both private equity, different volume. 
Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, let me see. Um, how do you balance return versus impact considerations during the due diligence of funds? And so how can I be comfortable as an investor that Carbon Equity really selects the most impactful funds? Uh, Lisa or Viva, would you like to answer this? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, uh, and it's a good question. Like, like Jacqueline explained, we are really impact first. So after we have um, uh, screened the market and found an investment opportunity, the first thing we do is our impact diligence. And it's critical that we do that well and that we do not select based on that uh, uh, impact diligence a fund that doesn't meet our criteria. So whenever a fund um, makes a lot of promises, but when we start digging, they don't um, stack up, then, the, then we will drop that opportunity. So we'll never, never select a fund that doesn't meet it. Now, once we have selected a fund that has um, um, the right impact potential, then we also want it to have financial return potential. So we are not philanthropists. Um, it, it, it is catalytic capital, but it also needs to return, but it's impact first. Really yeah. Um, a question, uh, perhaps uh, to Lisa. Um, how are we thinking about investing in climate adaptation solutions? That's a very good question, and we need a lot more investment there as well. Can stress that enough. Uh, I think carbon equity is really optimizing getting to net zero as soon as possible, because with every fraction of additional warming, we need so much more adaptation in the world. So. Basically, mitigating is the most effective thing we can do. We really encourage any kind of adaptation investment, but it's not what our fund is really focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, we do see that there's certain funds in the market that are combining the two, carbon mitigation, carbon adaptation. Um, and Carbon XT says that every fund should have at least 70% carbon reducing uh, technologies in there, but the other 30% can be other impact strategies, including climate adaptation. So you see a few investments, but we're like kind of full focus on getting to net zero. Yeah. Well, uh, Julian asks, what kind of specific impact measurement methods do you use? Impact assessments are already complicated for holdings, let alone fund of funds. It's a very good question. To ask one minute before the end of the session. Uh, I can talk for this, about this for a long time. But if I would really, really, really do it then, it's hard with early stage companies. They haven't realized a lot of impact. It's all about the future impact potential. Some of these companies are pre-commercial, pre-revenue, developing technologies that are not on the market yet. The way we're looking at it, it's all about which technologies are kind of critical for getting us to net zero. And that's what we do. So we look at the portfolio and we look at every single company. Are they making a product or a service that's critical for getting us to net zero? We do that based on comparison with drawdown, the IPCC report, McKinsey reports kind of there's a very good understanding of which technologies we need to get to net zero. So we say, okay, check, check, non-check which technologies there are, making sure that that way we really drive deep decarbonization and not just things that look green but are not essential. Cool. Well, that ended on the dot. Uh, thank you so much for your active participation, asking so many questions. Um, we will try to get back to questions that, uh, if you left your name, have not yet been answered. Um, thank you again. We will share a recording of this webinar with you in your mailbox. Uh, feel free to share that or rewatch it. Um, and we will send you a little bit more information. Thank you so much. Stay posted. A new webinar is coming up, I believe, in two weeks uh, with Arcturn uh, Ventures, uh, which is a um, Canadian-based venture capital fund. And we have Tom Rand on the show, who is an awesome human being, and we'll talk about uh, their perspective on investing in climate technology. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.